To start the session off, we'll have Manly Begay come up again, the co-director of the Harvard Project and also the director of the Native Nations Institute. Um, Manly is a great friend, and I hope that you learn a lot from his words. This is the this is the second to the last session, and the session is it's called. So you have a so you have a great program. Now what? <laughs> and and, uh, and and my wife would say, uh, whatever. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to just uh, w once again <coughs> uh, say hello to each of you and and also just acknowledge uh, uh, Amy Besaw and Andrew Lee and uh, Carmen Lopez and and the staff uh, Liz Hill outside and also uh, Liza right Liza Bemis and am I forgetting anybody I think that's and the, f the fine work that, that they're doing. So we should give them a, a round of applause. <laughs> they're, they're wonderful people. <clears throat> and in, in the past 16 years or so that I've been working with uh, the Harvard Project, uh, I've come ac across uh, many uh, wonderful people and each time we connected with uh, these individuals, we, we, we held on to them um, pretty tightly. Uh, originally, back in around 1987, uh, Joe Kalt uh, was actually wrestling with uh, an, an economics question. <coughs> and Joe was, was puzzled by the fact that, <coughs> that uh, as he was studying the US Forest Service land, in Arizona, in Central Eastern Arizona, uh, he was puzzled by the fact that uh, right next door was the White Mountain Apache Tribal Forest area, and and as as all good economists, you know, he's running numbers and you know trying to figure things out uh, sort of numerically and, and and so forth. And and what he was trying to figure out was was uh, why is it that uh, all of a sudden uh, in in this work he ran across the fact that White Mountain Apache Tribe was managing their forest land better than the U.S. Forest Service was managing theirs. And so he was faced with this question, you know, and he couldn't figure it out. And, <coughs> and, and Joe began to think, well, I guess, you know, economists uh, really don't rule the world, <laughs> or they like to think they do. And uh, he said, well, I've got to find you know, something else about what's going on here. He said, there's got to be somebody here at Harvard that knows something about Indians. So he starts looking through the phone book and, uh, and asking people questions, uh, you know, who here at Harvard knows about Indians, you know, besides the anthropologists. And, and lo and behold, he runs across uh, Steve Cornell. You know, Steve was in the sociology department at that time. Uh, and, and lo and behold, Steve <coughs> Uh, was working on a book and I think just finished a book called The Return of the Native. So the two of them have lunch and and Joe poses his question and lo and behold uh, the Harvard Project was born. Uh, a short time later, uh, a year or, or so later, um, I arrived at here at Harvard to work on a doctorate at the Graduate School of Education and I answered uh, a work-study ad uh, it was on the bulletin board at the Harvard uh, Native American Program office, and <coughs> and so I went to go see uh, Joe Colt at the Kennedy School. So I sat down with him, and and we talked uh, for gee, seemed like two, three hours. So I figured I was hired, you know, <laughs> and and uh, became um, you know one of the the first um, research assistants for the Harvard project. And there's another guy that was working there at that time with uh, Joan Steve, a gentleman named uh, Carl Eschbach. Carl has a, has a wide range of interests from uh, 
baseball to English tea. You know, inter interesting fellow. Uh, Carl, wonderful guy, um, was, was there working with uh, Joe and Steve. And then, you know, Carl and I shared an office <coughs> and uh, had many good conversations and, and fast got to know Carl as, as, a, as a wonderful human being. And a short time later, uh, well, well, Steve actually was here for maybe another year or two and then uh, went off to UC, University of California, San Diego. And, and then um, I was uh, fast promoted to the executive director position, which is what Andrew holds at, at the current time, and, uh, and began to work with the Harvard Project. <coughs> so for the next 15 years or so, um, I, I was here. Uh, finished my doctorate, um, uh, received a, a position at the Graduate School of Education and uh, became one of the co-directors uh, along with Joe and Steve. And in the course of the 15 years or so that the Harvard Project has been around and working in Indian country, uh, many wonderful individuals came our way and uh, I think many of them stayed with us. And they've formed their own careers and, and formed their own interests uh, about the work of nation building in Indian country. Uh, among these individuals <coughs> are uh, Jonathan Taylor, Kenny Grant, Eric Henson, Miriam Jorgensen, Elise Adams, and uh, Harry Nelson. Harry is uh, currently at the University of British Columbia in uh, Vancouver. And I was thinking about this today, uh, and those individuals I just mentioned were all, were all students at, uh, here at Harvard. Uh, many of them were at the Kennedy School of Government. And we've, we've not only uh, become uh, fast colleagues in this work, but have become uh, good friends and individuals that, uh, uh, that you know you can trust and, and respect. And so this is sort of the team that has formed the Harvard Project. Um, and a short time later, after Andrew graduated from uh, the Kennedy School, School of Government and was working at the Ford Foundation, uh, Andrew called and wanted to, to return back to, to Harvard and, and s see about um, finding a place with the Harvard Project, within the Harvard Project. And so he brought along with him uh, this idea of the Honoring Nations Program which I believe uh, he and Michael Lipsky had talked about for quite some time. And so Andrew came and, and joined the Harvard Project again, and Andrew, for the longest time, single-handedly put the Honoring Nations program together. And, and I think if there's anybody to be touted as, as uh, uh, the father of the Honoring Nations program, it is Andrew Lee. <laughs> And it's wonderful to see that uh, Carmen Lopez is uh, doing a great job with the Harvard University Native American program. And uh, Carmen um, has a little known distinction probably among all of us, uh, except for me, that she's a fantastic volleyball player. And uh, she and, and my daughter played volleyball at Dartmouth College and, um, uh, and always admired uh, Carmen when she played high school um, volleyball. Um, that's when I first noticed her, and uh, and Carmen is is doing a wonderful job here here at Harvard. It's good to to see her once again. I, I wanted to just make a, a brief statement about. Um, so you have a great program uh, now, uh, whatever you know, and but what I want to talk about is is um, is sort of. Uh, forward thinking. Uh, I want to talk about uh, strategic orientation, uh, long-term planning, and and thinking about um, sort of set the context for uh, my brother uh, Lenny Foster and and also who who else is uh, speaking? Um, I forget who else is speaking. It's I know it's not uh, Don Sampson. Rick George, Rick George will will come up uh, after. 
uh, after me. But I want to talk about, <coughs> okay, so now what? H where do we go with all of this? Uh, what do we do? How do we begin to think about the future? And I think sh strategic orientation really is a shift from reactive thinking to proactive thinking. It's not uh, just responding to crisis, uh, but trying to gain some control over the future. You know, trying to gain some control over the future, try to, to figure out where are we headed, what are we all about. And it's about, it's about a shift from short-term thinking to long-term thinking. <coughs> 25 years, 50 years from now, uh, what kind of society do you want? What kind of society do you want to create? It's a shift from opportunistic thinking to systemic thinking, focusing not on what can be funded, but how each option fits the society you're trying to build. It's a shift from a narrow problem focus to a broader focus on the community, fixing not just the problems, but, but societies, very much like what is going on throughout the world. I think Joe, at his opening address, talked about our trip to Poland. And while in Poland, you can tell they're working on trying to fix the society after colonization had occurred, uh, first with uh, Germany and then with uh, the Russians. And in some of my trips, uh, uh, abroad uh, to places like um, uh, Australia and New Zealand and South Africa, you know that these countries are, are facing some tremendous problems and issues, not unlike Indian country. South Africa faces problems with law enforcement. Uh, Russia is facing problems uh, with law enforcement. And you go to places like Australia where uh, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada are essentially Commonwealth countries and still wrestling with, with uh, some basic issues that we've somewhat resolved here in the US, like land, human rights, justice. Uh, and not that we, st we, we don't continue to fight for those things, but the, the issues in, in many of these countries are, are some 50, maybe even 100 years back from what we're dealing with here in the US. And in Indian country today, we're faced with, with some key strategic questions. You know, what kind of society are we trying to build? What kind of society are you trying to build? What do you hope will be different 25, 50 years from now? What do you hope will be the same? What do you wish to protect? What are you willing to change? What assets do you have to work with? And what makes sense to the community at large? And this is all in the context of, of a hard-nosed look at the reality and requirements of your situation. So essentially, it's, it's, it's our job as leaders and you as leaders from your respective nations to begin to think about how do you want your kids to live or their kids to live you know, 100 years from now? What kind of clothes will they be wearing? What language will they be speaking? Uh, where will they be living? What kind of home will they have? Uh, how will they worship? Where will they go to school? How much education will they have? What about cultural education? And these are all very tough and, and I think thought-provoking set of questions. And it's really about determining uh, nationhood, determining what shall we look like 100 years from now, and then how will we be remembered as leaders? You know, what sort of legacy uh, are we going to leave? Those 
and I talked about a bit about this the other day, you know, those that are yet unborn, you know, what are they going to be saying about us? Oh, that guy, that person did this. And to this day, you know, we live in this fashion, in this manner. You know, what kind of legacy are you going to leave? I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question we must all wrestle with because uh, life, life is short. Life is very short. And, and we don't have much time to waste because there's a lot of work to be done. And I think answering those questions requires uh, a tremendous amount of leadership. And I'm uh, uh, just deeply honored to be your presence because you're working hard. You're doing things that, uh, that needs to be done. And as leaders, <coughs> we have a tremendous amount of, of, of responsibility because leaders create or destroy a climate in which success can occur. They set a vision or not of where the nation is headed. They create or undermine institutions capable of effectively implementing a national vision. They, cre they create or abuse the rules of the game. They send signals that decisions will or will not be made by the rules and their fair interpretation. So in short, you know, leaders make choices and their choices matter. And as, as all of us are, uh, are, are leaders in one form or fashion, the choices we make matter. And effective nation building depends on those good choices that we make.